स्वयं प्रभा डिजिटल इंडिया एजुकेटेड इंडिया start with intertextuality or uh, continue rather with intertextuality we'll be talking about blade runner ridley scott movie uh, we have been talking about this film earlier also uh, but before i go headlong into the film i also want you to do an exercise please make a list of your uh, all time favorite movies any 10 films 10 actors male or female and 10 directors so this is an exercise i am going to give you 5 minutes for this please all of us need to know what we are watching good films good actors good directors could be even technicians if you are that aware of films so i am asking you actors let's put films first more important directors make a list what do you watch write down write it down it will you know once you write your thought process becomes much more clear so your top 10 favorite films favorite directors or any technician actors it could be from any part of the world we are not just talking about those which are made only in english language All right. Okay, we'll begin. Azhar. Welcome, five directors. Please. Uh, Raul Ruiz. Uh huh. Trofa. Kurosami. Trofa and Kurosami. Okay. Uh, Hitchcock. Uh huh. Then John Abraham. John Abraham from you know which John Abraham we are talking about. <laughs> yes John Abraham a highly respected um, Malayali director he also acted in a few movies you know that even in hindi movies there is a money call movie called uski roti a hindi movie in which john abraham acted as well new i know this because i have studied at ftii film and television institute pune so we are uh, exposed to that kind of cinema Okay, good. Actors, would you like to add to that? Yes. No preferences. Movies. Uh, I wrote down specific movies of these actors. Rufa, four hundred books. Okay, fine. Then I get a get an idea. Anyone at the back? Yes, you. Uh, I really like the Pulp Fiction. Tarantino. Okay. Tarantino is a pattern here, and Christopher Nolan is another pattern. So that those are expected answers. Yes. And, uh, there was a Hindi movie called Tarzan. That was really good. Amir Khan. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Uh, and there was a recent movie called Barfi in Hindi. Barfi? Yeah. Yes. Was, uh, I am told Barfi is a. Copy. Yes. Watch for the other movie. Yeah, I, yeah. I know it. <laughs> But not intertextual. <laughs> there is no intertextuality going on there. There is lot of plagiarism. Pulp fiction is an inter intertextual film. It's a direct quotation. Yes, please. Uh, and there's a movie called uh, October Sky. Okay. And, uh, yeah, and the usual suspect. The usual suspects. Good. Yes, in the blue T-shirt. The film Kramer versus Kramer. Kramer versus Kramer. Yeah. And adaptation. Adaptation. Uh, Kaufman Brothers. Guy Ritchie is another perennial favorite of IIT. Yes. And the Dark Knight. Who's afraid of Virginia Woolf? Ah, have you watched the movie? Who's afraid of Virginia? Is there anyone who, anyone else who has watched the movie? Who has, who is afraid of Virginia Woolf? You, and you. Okay, let's have a screening of. the movie okay so ranjit is going to send you a list soon you count monte cristo 
the both, new one guy pierce both, both i like them both and uh, v for vendetta v for vendetta yes yeah. who directed it does anyone remember the wachowski, wachowski brothers wachowski brothers yes uh, they were brothers once now they are brother and sister brother and sister there is another kind of text going on here I also like Watchmen, uh, Seven Samurai, and then you know the usual lot of things. How about yeah, basically talking about action cinema here. <laughs> yes. Yeah. Vedant. Actors are Marilus Sean Connery. Uh, I didn't get the first name. Sean Connery. Sean Connery. And Christian uh, Bale. Hmm? Tom Hardy. I liked his uh, part in Boy. Have you watched Tom Hardy's The Fighter? The Fighter is a very good movie. Watch it if you haven't. Done so already. The fighter. I, I'm so sorry. The warrior. Yes, the warrior. The where he plays again is a boxing movie. Fighter is Christian Bale and Mark Wahlberg. A, a, another excellent movie. Yes. Yes. And who else? Yeah. Matthew McConaughey for his Yeah. Yeah. Okay. At the back. Yes, you. Yeah. Last bench. Yes, I am talking to you. Movies. Let us talk about favorite movies. I am sure you have a list. Okay. Dark Knight. Okay. What about you? Yes. I like the, the good, the bad, and the good. Okay. So, Spaghetti Western, yes. Apocalypto. Oh, Mel Gibson's, yes. How many of you have watched Coppola's Apocalypse now? Quite a few. Please watch it. Uh, it's a, it's a difficult movie to teach, as well as difficult movie to screen in a class. Okay, uh, it's a, uh, the uncut version. Just goes on and on. And perhaps some of you may not have the patience and also the time to sit through it while doing it, if you do it for a screening. But please watch it at home, Apocalypse Now. And another movie I keep on talking about very often, that is Once Upon a Time in America, Sergio Leone is four and a half. I have the uncut DVD, original, not pirated, okay. and it is a great movie. It's a great movie. You, you, every time you watch it, you learn something new about it. It's fantastic. I don't have the words to talk about it, but we will be discussing the movie. I hope that you watch it. Otherwise, give you our wish list to Ranjit. Please be more involved in the classroom activities. You know, so I have asked you to send you a list. Send Ranjit a list of key concepts. Ranjit is going to send you a list with all your names and schedule. Who is going to do a what presentation on yeah? So just send your uh, uh, the the key concept that you want to talk about, and also list of films that you would like to uh, like us to screen, and then we can talk about those films here. Okay, Vijay, please do that. What about you, actors? Let's have actors list from you. Jim Carrey and ah. Rowan Atkinson. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I really like Jim Carrey. Yesterday there was. Showing or telecasting liar liar, okay. One of my, you know, it, it's one of those feel good movies. Don't snigger. <laughs> it's a good movie. <coughs> it really is good. Yeah, yeah, it's fantastic. I love it. Yes. And Rowan Atkinson. Rowan Atkinson. This guy likes comedies. Yes. yes. Yeah. Rowan Atkinson. Why not? Yes. He can still pull it off. Johnny English reborn. Yeah. And Morgan Freeman. Morgan Freeman. So suddenly you get very serious now. Yes. Jackie Chan. Ah, <laughs> Jackie Chan. Yes. There is a pattern here. Ranjit. Uh, okay. I have a list of movies. Uh, Requiem for a Dream. Mm -hmm. uh, Eternal Sunshine and Spotless Mind. Yeah. Uh, the Rocky Horror Picture Show. That's cult. Uh, Brazil. Mm -hmm. uh, Monty Python's Life of Brian. Snatch, Guy Ritchie, Edward Scissorhands, Tim Burton, The Shining, Kubrick, 
clockwork orange and uh, omni. Okay, serious cinema. Yeah, really cerebral. Uh, what about you, Rehan? Uh, Apocalypse now. Uh, let's have your actors. Actors have uh, not down three: John Goodman, Paul Giamatti, and uh, John Turturro. Okay, so uh, all coi coin. <laughs> yes, RT types. Uh, do we have a list of directors? Uh, Scorsese, Coen Brothers, Coppola, Tarantino, Hitchcock. Okay, very mainstream Hollywood. Good. Anyone else who would like to share? Shweta, Tara. Please. Uh, I like Nagesh Kukunur, Vishal Bharadwaj, and Mani Ratnam. Yeah. And uh, in the movies, I put down Karanta Kukumital, Hazaro Kohishe, AC, Panchatantra, Ramde Basanti, and Iqbal. Mm -hmm. Okay. Interesting. Very nice. Tara, would you like to share? Actors, at least? <laughs> Okay. Anyone else, please? Vijay? Uh, At least Vijay watches movies, he, she can tell us about that. I don't have a problem. What about you? Yes. Yes. What is your name? Arvind. Arvind? Yes. Uh, Kevin Spacey and Liam Neeson, uh, Shidler's List. And, uh, I'm a fan of Tarantino's uh, Reservoir Dogs. Uh, Kill Bill, Nolan's sci-fi Okay, so stand. Anyone else who would like to share? Yes, please. I'll I'll come to you. Yes, you in the black T-shirt. What's your name? Abhishek. Abhishek. Uh, I would like to share the actors: uh, Vita Bachchan, Edward Norton, Brad Pitt, Meryl Streep, Judy Foster. Yeah, all very well known mainstream. Yes, good. For directors, I just wanted to add Sidney Lumet. Yes, Sidney Lumet is very important. Uh, have we done anything by Sidney Lumet in this class? Dog Day Afternoon? Yes. So, Sidney Lumet, 12 Angry, uh, 12 Angry Men, and also Dog Day Afternoon. Okay, so another very, very acclaimed director. So, fine, I, I understand it is more or less a predictable list, but good, thanks. So, now we know what we are watching. Uh, so, uh, a good exercise would be that, yeah, most I feel that most of you are into mainstream, very well known films, okay. but keep as we talk about films in the class, keep um, at least try watching other films also. Okay. For example, Harold and Harold and Maud, okay. it is a, a very, very charming, interesting movie, but people just uh, get put off. Why? Because it is a love story between an 80 year old woman played by Ruth Gordon and a 20 year old boy. And it is not a platonic relationship, I mean you would think it is a love story and now a clean love story, but it is not, <laughs> it is not that clean love story. We, yeah, so, uh, it was a critical commercial disaster when it first released. Okay. Who directed it? Do you remember? He was a wonderful filmmaker, one of the pioneers of the so called counter culture cinema, the new wave Hollywood. Have I ever spoken to you about the new, I mean all these actors, all these great directors are products of new wave Hollywood, a new Hollywood. Harold and Maud was directed by someone called Hal Ashby. The movie was such a disaster, after that he, his career was more or less over, but now the film is regarded as a cult film. Remember the other day we were talking about cult, intertextuality and how movies acquire a cult status, a commercial failure, a critical failure, but today people watch it. Do you remember Ranjit, when Shimit Amin was with us in 2010 for our workshop, okay. he taught us the movie the, by way of its screenplay, Harold and Maud. Okay. Shimit Amin, the great contemporary, one of our best contemporary directors, Chak the India, Aptak Chappan and Rocket Singh. Okay. 
So, he was with us in two, 2010 and he taught gave us a uh, you know workshop on his screenplay writing and discussed Harold and Maud Threadbare. It was a very, it is an interesting movie. However, we are talking intertextuality cult status. Again, let me tell you the Blade Runner was not a great success when it was first released. Even today, if you watch it, you will miss out on several aspects of the film. We do not know what is happening here, okay. but uh, today it is a cult classic. So, cults have as we were talking about the other day a loyal following. At the time of release, they may they may not necessarily receive a very popular reception. It and by popular reception, I do not mean crit, uh, commercial reception, but also critical reception. Harold and Maud was just ripped apart, trashed like anything, but today it is a classic. People revisit the movie. Okay. Um, coming to counterculture cinema, and I, I am extremely interested in that film, uh, that that aspect, and also new Hollywood. Can you give me some examples of new Hollywood filmmakers? Don't say Scorsese and Coppola. I, I know that you know Scorsese, and I know that you know The Godfather, and therefore you know Francis Ford Coppola. Who are the other names? I mean, we just talked about a lesser-known guy, Hal Ashby. Woody Allen has become very mainstream now. Okay, well, watch his uh, the late, the, uh, more recent, that Ma Midnight in Paris. Now he works only with big stars, Penelope Cruz, and please do. I am very sure you have watched because of its music. Another great movie of that period, Easy Rider. Fantastic movie. When I do counterculture cinema, I am going to refer to all these, but please come having watched the movie. You need to. Harold and Maud. So, who directed Easy Rider? Well, he was a well known actor, you should know. He was the villain in Speed. Dennis Hopper. Okay, Dennis Hopper also did a part in uh, uh, Apocalypse Now. He is the, he's the American photographer. Yes. Okay, Easy Rider was uh, jointly written by Peter Fonda and Jane Fonda's brother, yes, and Dennis Hopper. Yeah. Chinatown, uh, another great movie. Please, please, please watch all these movies. Okay, they are essential. I mean, they are no fun in doing a course like film studies. If you do not know the, I mean, of course, Tarantino is great, Coppola is great, and we know Scorsese and Guy Ritchie, Christopher Nolan, of course. Also know these films. Also know who starred, acted, uh, and worked as, as the technicians on these films. It is important to know. Hmm. So, we were talking about uh, intertextuality. Cult, I have already talked about. Okay. We were talking about the three major aspects of Blade Runner and the postmodernist elements in the Blade Runner. I will be doing modernism and postmodernism as well, but, but start thinking along those lines. What is postmodernism? What is modernism? So, city speak, we were talking about in our last session also, the kind of language people speak, and you just saw a clipping, staccato, okay. uh, non sequitur, coining of original words, all this because it is Philip K. Dick style, of course. But then also Ridley Scott added his own touches to the dialogues. The Tyrell Corporation, centralized, autocratic, completely in control, insisting on conformity. What does it tell you? 
is a critique of the US itself, okay. a huge conglomerate which is out to con take control over everything. Otherwise, it, 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 it expects replicants that means, people who conform, you know, um, those uh, assembly line products, people who will take orders meekly and quietly and conform and they can be eliminated any time at the corporation's will. So, that was nothing but a critique of the way the US functions and all, remember all these were uh, children of the Vietnam generation, the writers, directors, people like Philip K. Dick. Okay. They were extremely uh, critical of US's uh, intervention in other countries' foreign policies, its expansionist tendencies. So, films like the Blade Runner, they were like uh, uh, <coughs> a response to US's expansionist uh, tendencies. And of course, uh, it anticipates Reagan's era as, as well, which was a study in excesses, too much power, too much capitalism and ruthlessness in dealing with people and any voice of dissent. Did you get time to watch uh, Blade Runner during the weekend? Did you? Okay, any comments you would like to make about the film? You want to say something? The population, uh, okay. citizens of the city are, uh, uh, it consists of various traditions like hmm. Japanese, are there, Chinese, are there, Mexicans. Are there. It is a melting pot, okay, multicultural yeah, society. Yeah, and what kind of a rain is that? It is a very, is it a very cleansing, purifying? No. Why do you shake your head? Why do you think it is? It is not? in the seven movie also, it is shown like that. Yeah, good. So, he can draw parallels between the rain in uh, seven and yeah. in uh, Blade Runner. Okay, so, rain usually associated with purifying and cleansing is not the it's not the same situation the same case in these two movies it's like raining poison raining acid and a noxious yes please the sense of uh, dystopic society yeah it's always like, uh, almost like matrix which is another kind of uh, artificial light, lightings, right. Yeah. However, if you are on the topic of lights and if you are interested in cinematography, please, please watch The Godfather. Okay. If you have not already watched wa uh, watch the movie, please watch it all over again, just to look at the way the movie begins. Okay. It is a wonderful movie, the, the way the screenplay is written, Coppola collaborated on the screenplay also, but although it is a very pulpy, salacious novel by Mario Puzo, but the movie, this is one exception where the film is much better than the novel. Usually, we say the film does not live up to the original novel, but Coppola made the godfather his own. Okay. And the second part with the De Niro playing a younger version, okay, it is not there in the novel. It is all Coppola's invention. Let us uh, forget the third part for the time being, okay. but two great movies, not bad at all. And after that, he could make Apocalypse Now. So, of course, that. So, three movies are enough to keep, keep any director alive. So, finest. There is also a movie called The Conversation, remember by Coppola, Gene Hackman. The conversation, please watch the movie, it is all about, uh, good, oh, 
<laughs> you are into Coppola. <laughs> Good. I watched for the other guy, John Kazan. Hmm? John Kezal, yeah, he is talking about the guy who is uh, with Al Pacino in Dog Day Afternoon. Remember, he is one of the robbers, the, the more eccentric one. Yes, Sal. He is uh, the brother in The Godfather. Yeah, and in, yes, he is the guy who gets killed, uh, Al Pacino character. You have not watched Godfather? <laughs> Please watch it. And um, of course, John Kazal, he acted only in couple of movies as he rightly pointed out, The Deer Hunter. Yeah. Okay. So, cities peak in the Blade Runner, city is a tower of Babel, people, is, people are polyglots, people speak too many languages. So, street jargon comprises Spanish, French, German, Chinese, Japanese. And English is the lingua franca, the standard way. And then you have vernacular Chinese and Japanese uh, for the petty entrepreneurs, which we just saw a scene where Harrison Ford is trying to eat his noodles, the pair of chopsticks. So he's talking to those because that's a vernacular language. Okay, for but for the elite elites, it's English. Hmm? And uh, code switching, Creole and Esper, the way, you know Creole is the corrupted form of language. And uh, Esper, Esper is a scientifically developed language codified. Okay, so, the talking computer network is specialized, accessible only to the elite and the specialists. So, plenty of languages existing. In the sense, so that is also one example of intertextuality. Okay, uh, we are going to look at another concept called pastish. So, Tyrell Corporation, you get to see this name very often, it is you know, it's like big brother is watching you, it is always there, okay, that is mentioned in big bold letters throughout. There is also a huge tower like structure, okay, um, you know, almost like rising above the entire city scape, taking control over the city is that kind of construction. And uh, um, uh, the building is one mile high. It 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 is a reference to Frank Lloyd Wright's skyscraper project. Those of you who are interested in urbanization and cities, they should know. There is a there used to be a guy called Frank Lloyd Wright. Of course, yeah. who what's what's that novel based on him? In runs the fountain head. Okay. Watch the fountain head. See, I never ask you to read anything in this course, right? I keep asking you to watch movies. You would not find a better teacher, no? Okay. Watch movies. So, watch the fountain head. Do not read the novel, watch the movie with Gary Cooper. Okay. And Gary is the novel is based on uh, an architect, a real life architect, Frank Lloyd Wright. He embarked on a on an unfinished project, which which was called popularly a skyscraper project. It was supposedly one mile high, okay. But but it it never got over. And in the movie, but we get to see such a building, okay. So again, it's a reference to something which ever was happening. So pastish, intertextual references. So the, when we talk about these things, we Assume that you are talking to a set of audience who is in the know. That is the idea of pastish intertextualities. Plagiarism, plagiarism uh, banks on the idea that people are not aware of these things, the original. So, they are stupids. Hmm? Intertextuality, on the other hand, assumes that the audience is aware of this and therefore, we are 
we are talking to an intelligent audience, a well informed audience, so that is the idea. Okay, the replicant Tyrell Corporation is involved in the construction or manufacturing of the replicants used for the defense program. Again, a critique of US's military policies. Tyrell Corporation also uses these replicants for political killings and handling nuclear material, and they also deal in sub specialization like the eye maker, you know, the eye shop. So, we when we talked about when I was introducing the film to you, I said eye is an important motif in the movie. The movie opens with close up shot of an eye, and then you also have the character of an eye maker, there is an eye shop. indicating assembly line, production, Fordism, etcetera. So, what was the intention now, Philip K. Dix and Philip, uh, uh, I am sure some of you are into watching science, uh, science fiction, so um, a scanner darkly, if you have not, please watch it. Are you aware of this movie, a scanner darkly, people at the back, a scanner darkly based on Philip K. Dick's novel, please watch it. Okay. You will have uh, Kevin Spacey again, you do have uh, Keanu Reeves of course, but is, you also have Kevin Spacey as far as I can remember, it is a multi starer, very good excellent ensemble cast, but uh, yeah it is headed by Keanu Reeves, but there are many more very well. Uh, recognized actors. Please watch it. I want you to watch it for the technique here, Scanner Darkly. I am not giving the game away right now. Again, based on Philip K. Dick's novel, but beautifully made. So, the idea, and this is a, a recurring idea in all Philip K. Dick's novel that moral question arises from the possibility that human beings might be retired by mistake. Okay. So, human beings can be retired by mistake, that means replicants which can be retired at will, that is eliminated. And the idea is that Tyrell uh, Corporation has the authority, the moral right to eliminate people by mistake, by mistake in with that is quote unquote, but absolute power, absolute control over people. And in the scene we just watched there is a test to identify replicants, where uh, people can be retired at choice, at will. So, the certain type, if you respond to a certain kind of a test, you are in, if you do not, you are out. Okay. So, that is the kind of society, a dystopic version of society that is being talked about. So, it is not just a random science fiction we are talking about, it is something which is very dangerous which can happen in our society and which is happening to a large extent around a certain kind of people are eliminated and while certain type of people are considered good enough and uh, they should be nurtured, okay, whereas certain people are not wanted and they should be eliminated. Yeah. So, there is an allegory here. All right. So, read the novel if you want, watch a scanner darkly and also the movie Blade Runner, wonderful movie and I am sure if you are a fan of science fiction, then you will enjoy it. Um, coming back again to the concept of intertextuality, just wanted to, I was giving it a thought and I was uh, watching a couple of movies and I thought of uh, Gregory Peck, uh, the great actor Gregory Peck, who acted in Herman Melville's uh, Moby Dick, Herman Melville the novelist and his uh, the novel Moby Dick was made into a movie in 1956. Gregory Peck played the lead role Captain Ahab in the original version Moby Dick. I think it was directed by John Huston. The movie was uh, has been remade several times, but there was a very popular remake in 1998 also uh, starring Patrick Stewart, the Star Trek guy. 
And now, why are we talking about intertextuality? I am not just talking about a remake now. Gregory Peck, now in 1998, how old do you think he must have been? In his 80s. So, the great star now in his 80s, definitely he cannot play a 50 year old Captain Ahab. Okay. But the filmmakers in the remade version wanted to pay homage to the original version and what they do? There is a, uh, there is a character called Father Maple in Moby Dick. He just appears for a while in the novel, in the movie okay. and now our grand old man Gregory Peck plays Father Maple's role in the 1998 version. What are the filmmakers doing? Quoting the original. You do not need Gregory Peck in that small role. Okay, but you bring him back. Okay, it's a it's an intertextual reference that you will see. Captain Ahab lives on. He is very much a part of this movie. Homage to Gregory Peck and the John Huston version of it of the movie. Another excellent example of intertextuality is Cape Fear. How many of you are familiar with Cape Fear? Scorsese fans all over. So, Cape Fear? No one else? Very strange. Please, please watch, may make it essential watching, essential viewing. Cape Fear, at least a Scorsese version 1991. Nick Nolte, Gregory Peck, Juliet Lewis, Jessica Lange. Yes. Robert De Niro plays the dreaded Cape. So, uh, Cape Fear. Now, um, the original was made in 1962, starring Gregory Peck in the role which was later played by Nick Nolte in Scorsese's version and Robert Mitchum. And Robert Mitchum's role was played by, he is an anti-hero played by De Niro. De Niro has a menacing presence, so you can well imagine Mitchum too had a menacing presence. So, uh, that role was played uh, by Robert De Niro in Scorsese's version. Now, why are we talking about that? What is the story of Cape Fear all about? Uh, Let us have the focus on our friend, he knows the movie. Uh, so, uh, Robert De Niro plays a criminal uh, and Nick Nolte plays his defense lawyer. And uh, after Robert De Niro gets sent to jail, after he gets out of jail, he tries to take revenge on his lawyer for not defending him adequately. And so, he stalks his family. And yeah, so Robert De Niro stalks Nick Nolte's family and the family is in a very vulnerable position. There is a young daughter, yeah? there is a beautiful attractive wife played by Jessica Lange. And uh, originally this uh, criminal, he has been accused of raping a minor okay? and he says that his attorney did not put in enough effort in defending him and rescuing him and he ends up in jail for 14 years or so, something like that. He comes out hardened, brutalized okay, and full of revenge. He has his body tattooed with uh, images of uh, justice and quotations from Bible and all over and he vengeance is me and become vengeance. So, he keeps on shouting throughout the film. Okay. Now, he is a menacing presence in the movie. He starts stalking his attorney's wife and young daughter and in a chilling scene, he stalks Juliet Lewis, a very young Juliet Lewis, I think that was her debut. She is 14 or 15 in the movie and he does not do anything to her, but you get a sense that he is about to. Okay. And they dis sit and discuss erotic novels, uh, particularly by Henry Miller, Tropic of Cap Capricorn and all those things. So, yeah, it is a very, and the climax is very gruesome, very violent, very brutal typical uh, uh, action thriller, but why are we now talking, why are we talking about 
intertextual element in the movie at all. Why are we talking about the intertextuality at all? Now, we have Robert Mitchum and Gregory Peck in the original version. In the remade version, we have Nick Nolte and De Niro, fine. But uh, <coughs> the filmmaker and Martin Scorsese happens to be a great cinephile. Okay. We were also talking about the way he has been doing a restoration of old movies. Remember Technicolor, Eastman Color and all those things. So, he is involved in rescuing cinema from uh, 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 re uh, cinematic reels of great classics from uh, disintegration. So, he is he if you read up on Martin Scorsese, you will realize that he is a connoisseur, he is a walking encyclopedia of cinema. Why he wants to do this? Now, he brings Gregory Peck and Robert Mitchum again in his version of Gre Cape Fear. Now, these are two grand old men in their 80s and what do they do there here? They are not cops, they are defense attorneys. One prosecutes De Niro, another one defends him. Okay. So, bringing those two great actors, I mean anyone else could have done very well, but why bring only Mitchum and Peck a homage? a very obvious intertextual reference to the original classic. Martin Scorsese is saying, look, I am not plagiarizing. I know that you know that I am remaking the classic okay? and let us not forget that we have people here. Okay? These people are here. This is my uh, acknowledgement of the classic. So, that is what intertextuality is. So, as opposed to blatant plagiarism. Comments, questions, observations please. If you can think of something similar, Ma uh, please, Rehan. Yeah. Uh, so here we have just uh, the, uh, both the cases are just bringing back the actors of paying homage. Hmm. Is it actually intertextuality, or are we uh, in is intertextuality actually taking ideas or something? Yeah, absolutely, there is an idea. So the, they are, but they are uh, uh, being quite blatant now and being very in your face. I'm taking the idea. It's an official remake, but I'm also uh, you know, perhaps rubbing it in that look, it is is there. So, it is a good example of it. I am just giving you these two examples from very accessible films and very well known actors. These things are done. So, ideas, yes, songs, yes, inclusion of songs, inclusion of certain costumes. So, you, you gave me the example Kill Bill, okay. Kill Bill wearing, um, the bride wearing Bruce. Um, Bruce Lee's costume, okay. intertextuality, it is not a blatant plagiarism. You know the movie, you know Bruce Lee, you know that Tarantino is, a, is an aficionado of the, those uh, Chinese and Japanese martial arts films. He is paying a homage, you ought to know that, you ought to know where he comes from, that is what is happening. So, it could, it can be in any way. Intertextual references in, in, in an animated film like Shrek, how many are there? Too many to count, too many to count. Shrek, okay, especially the first version. There is a scene where, uh, what is her name? The, the princess? Fiona. Fiona is rescuing her, uh, her ogre. What is his name? Shrek, the ogre. Yeah. And in a matrix like scene, remember, she is, she defies gravity, okay, while she fights a bunch of um, ruffians, okay. And then you find that, that's a homage, that's an intertextual reference to matrix. Carrie and Moss doing the same. Absolutely. And they all, you know, Pinocchio at one point and gingerbread man running all over the place. <laughs> okay. So, that is all. You need to know, it is the filmmakers want you to know that I know you know these people. I treat you on par with me. I am not dumbing you down. I know that you know. So, that is intertextuality. Plagiarism is dumbing you down. Intertextuality 
capitalizes on the fact that you are on par with the filmmaker, you are an informed audience, you know what I am talking about, you know that these, this is Gregory Peck and you know why I want him in Father Maple's role. You know these, are, this is Gregory Peck and Mitchum and you know why I want them in Cape Fear. I can have anyone in this role, I can have Schwarzenegger playing attorney, why not? I can have Bruce Willis, no I, do, I want only Peck and Mitchum combination coming together for second and last time. So, not just a homage, not just a fan paying homage, but also a very strong intertextual reference, alludes to the original classic. Any, anything that you can think of? I am not talking a spoof, see let us not confuse a spoof, uh, Shrek is not a spoof. Shrek is a, people have done work, uh, written scholarly papers on Shrek as an intertextual text, full of okay, Rupert Everett, Everett's character, charming, okay, is, uh, is actually uh, um, an allusion to the guy who owned Disney, the studio. Like scary movie and all that, there are references to movies like screen. They are done to evoke, to evoke what? Laughter. Yeah, they are uh, uh, Johnny English is a, a spoof on Bond movies, all these espionage movies. See, parody is a serious business. We are going to talk about it in literature, parody, Linda Hutchins term is a very serious. So, we use parody very lightly, you know it is a parody. Okay, thank you so much. Bye-bye.